Welcome back to Acer P Bonsai. On this week's episode, we are going to do an air layer extravaganza. Our first subject is gonna be this blood good. It was nearly dead. I rescued it out of a landscape down in Charleston two years ago now. So I have been slowly nursing it back to health. And this year it put on a large, robust leaf set. I'm really excited about it. I'm sure you see down here a little lower these green leaves and I can hear the complaints coming already. No, I did not let shoots grow below the graft. These are actually uh, the tops of some successful root grafts that I did. So before we get started on the air layer, let me bring you in close and take a look at the tree. We've got something great going on down below here that we're gonna turn into a future bonsai. We're also gonna air layer the top of this tree off. It's got just an amazing amount of girth to it, some interesting movement, and we are going to turn this into a bonsai in a few years. We're also gonna eventually graft over this large leafed blood good material uh, to put something more interesting on for bonsai. So come on in close, let's take a look at what we're working with here. I wanted to show you all the base of this tree and it is absolutely beautiful. You can see here how wide this is. So this root graft is a little more hidden, hard to see, but let me spin you around. There is a large area of deadwood here, and you can see you've already started to heal it. Um, the cut putty had already fell off. I'm gonna have to clean this up and reapply some additional cut putty so we can continue working on healing this wound. Back over here, this one is a little easier to see. So let me zoom you in close and show you what we've got going on here. All right, so this was a root graft. You can see here where the tree connects and that root is going down into the soil. It's fused quite nicely here. I need to clean this up and get the moss out of there. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to come in here and scrape away all of this moss that started to grow around it. Looks like there's another root up high here. That's interesting. That one must have sprung out of the side there. But we do need to get all of this moss away from our site here. With excess moisture buildup, that can cause some rot to set in. This was one of my very first attempts at a root graft, and I might not have pushed it down deep enough into the tree, but because this is such a massive overall size, there's plenty of time to grow this root out and refine uh, the top of this connection point. So that's gonna be just fine. Let me get this cleaned out there. And as you can see, this root here just plunged straight down. It didn't have any lateral roots. But you can see to the right here and to the left, there were some nicer roots. So I wanted to make something analogous here in this central portion that's also kind of concave back a little bit. It's survived, so that's better than what I could have expected, not really knowing what I was doing at the time. All right, we've got a lot of that moss out of here. So what we're going to do next is we're going to pull this grafting pin out and take a look at the site. These round nose pliers are pretty useful, just a cheap set, you know, ordered online, uh, but they have these rounded tips. So they're really great for working with wire uh, or just trying to get a really nice connection. You see when I have them closed, they meet right at the tip. And so you're gonna have a nice strong grip at the end of these pliers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put these pliers under the edge of that grafting pin and then I'm gonna use this point here as a fulcrum to pu pull that back away from there. See how I'm doing that? Boom, right away. And as you can see, the little sapling has grafted on to the host quite well. That's interesting, maybe we can get that root out of there. Convince that. Yeah, we'll just leave that there for now. We can always cut that later. But we're gonna dig down a little bit and see if we can Identify. Oh yeah, look at that. We've got a nice lateral root. Can you guys see that? Nice lateral root coming out this way. This is going to be between this root and this root. That is going to be set up to really increase the quality of the nabari on this tree. I'm going to give the upper portion a little bit of a trim just to start transitioning the energy to the main uh, trunk of the tree, uh, but we are going to, we aren't going to reduce it completely. We're just going to do a very light trim we don't want this interfering with any of the work we've got going on the rest of the tree. And so just a real simple cutback. We've got ourselves a little miniature tree here. 
get rid of a few of these leaves just so we have a nice open view of our trunk. So we've got our nice little cute tree here, continue developing this root, and we will come back and look at this again either in the fall or possibly next spring. But there's no rush on this. Eventually we are going to create a sumo out of this bottom portion of the trunk. So you can see the graft line here uh, where the blood good was uh, grafted onto whatever this lower material. And I haven't seen any new buds shoot from this tree itself. So I'm not certain of the type of foliage that's on this rootstock. Um, but we do know that because the taper is so steep through here, we're probably gonna end up cutting below this graft line anyway. But I need to make sure that we have a nice new apex started probably through an approach graft or a thread graft that we will apply next spring. And this is gonna be several years in the making. We have this large wound here that we're still working on. And so we're in no rush to get that started. And as you can see here, we have this lovely little blood good side branch that's formed here. And if we spin around this way, we have another shoot over here. So these we can expect to explode in growth. Here's that other root graft that's going crazy over on this side. I need to make sure that this tree here does not shade out our little whip here. We need this to be growing strong and take over as the main leader of this tree. I'm gonna have to move this out of the way. I'll probably just wire it down off to the side here so it doesn't interfere with anything. We don't want it to be above this blood good shoot here. So I'm just gonna take a simple piece of aluminum wire and I am going to tie that loosely around the trunk here to make sure that it stays out of our way. Get a couple of these leaves, get those out of the way. I want to make sure that they are not growing anywhere near our little blood good shoot there. All right, now that we've gotten the root grafts taken care of, the foliage is out of the way, not interfering with our blood good shoots, we can move up. All right, and I wanted to make sure that you all had an opportunity to see the structure that we're working with here. So as we rotate around, you can see we have this really nice lateral branch here that's gonna be one of the trunks. The central leader goes up really high into the tree. And then we've got another nice, really thick branch over here that splits into two right there. This is going to be the base of our new tree. So we are going to air layer this tree right here and create a really gnarly triple trunk. Here I've got a branch that I have been bending down. You can see I kind of used a creative approach. I had one of these hook screws and I just drilled it into the this old dead branch here and it was a really useful anchoring point. All right, so step one is to always start with a fresh blade. You can use an X-Acto knife that's been cleaned with alcohol, but generally for air layers, I like to start with just these really inexpensive razor blades. I buy them in a pack of 50 or 100 from the hardware store and I know that they're going to be clean starting right out of the box. We do want to select our air layer site to be kind of at that widest point you can find that naturally sits at the bottom of the branches and so I am going to apply it right in this area here and what I generally do if you're if you're uncomfortable with doing it by eye it is okay to mark a line with a sharpie or a ballpoint pen to make sure that you can stay on your planned line. Uh, I'm gonna just slice along this with the blade and I kind of edge it forward, slicing through it, and then I'll rock it back and forth as I go. Keeping my blade aligned and I'm making my way around the perimeter of the tree here, just like that. You can see I'm kind of doing this seesaw motion here. Make sure I'm getting all the way in there into that, through all that bark. It's okay to accidentally cut a little bit below. If you're cutting a little bit accidentally below your main cut, that's okay. We're gonna remove all this bark here. What's important is this main line. There we go. Let's get that there. We may inch this a little bit higher as we go but I wanted to set an initial line. All right, there we go. We're going to make another cut. Generally, you wanna go as long as the trunk is wide when you're doing one of these. 
So we're gonna cut a really big section out of this. Let's rotate around as we go. We're gonna cut around the circumference of this tree here. So the other benefit of using this razor blade instead of a big knife is that you can fit it into little areas. So this is a fairly open section here, but sometimes you'll be doing an air layer deep down inside of a bunch of branches. And so the larger your knife, the more of a pain in the butt it is to try to get the bark removed without knocking into branches or damaging leaves. All right, so we've made our way around it. We've got our initial mark, the high point there. This is where the roots are going to come out and then the bottom point here is where we're going to remove the bark. I generally start down here at the bottom and I will use my blade here to just remove a section of bark. That's kind of the first step. It's getting that initial initial bark removed here and this is a fairly sturdy bark layer. There we go right up to there. All right, and you can start to see it right there. I've only made it down to the xylem there at the top. Can you see that transition from this lime green? It starts to get pithy, and then you can see the lighter yellow wood there. So we're gonna just keep digging away and make sure we get all the way through that bark. So as you can see, we've got our cork cambium, which is a fancy word for the bark, okay? And then we have the phloem of the tree, and you can kind of see that there. It's kind of this limey color. And that phloem is the layer, kind of like the circulatory system of the tree, where the sugars produced in the leaves and hormonal signals will travel down to the roots. Inside of that, you're gonna have a layer of cambium, which not only is it the stem cell layer, but it is the separating point between your phloem and your xylem. Xylem is a fancy word for the wood of the tree. Now the wood of the tree is responsible, of course, for the structure to hold the whole tree up, but it also serves as the portion of the vascular system where water and nutrients travel up from the roots up into the newly forming branches and leaves. When we're applying an air layer, we are making a break in that circulatory system. As you can see, the wood of the tree is still intact, which means that the nutrients and water flowing up from the roots continues. So the top of the tree is not at risk of dying, at least not immediately, because it's gonna to continue to be fed by the lower portion of the tree. However, all of these leaves above that were formerly feeding the roots, their sugar and their hormonal messages are not gonna flow down because we've interrupted the phloem of the tree. The phloem, again, is that outer layer outside of the cambium layer but below the bark or the cork cambium, essentially when the leaves produce sugar, they're gonna send a signal down to the roots saying, hey, here's some sugar. And then here's a chemical message that says, I'm doing good at producing sugar, which is my job. So can you produce more roots and send more water and nutrients back up to me so I can continue to trade resources with you to strengthen the overall tree? Removing that bark. And because this tree is fairly mature, it's a really thick layer. When you do your air layers on younger material, sometimes this process of getting down through the cambium, sometimes it's only like a millimeter or less. It can be quite thin. So when you're working on these more mature trees, it's important that you really dig in and ensure that you're making it all the way through the bark. All right, so I think what I need to do is actually cut a little bit deeper I didn't cut quite deep enough. So let's keep going around here. Let's make sure we cut all the way down through that bark. There you can see that we have made our way all the way around the tree, making sure that we've cut nice and deep into that bark. This little wire is kind of in my way. There we go. See how we're removing that? It's okay if it's a little bit jagged on the bottom. We're not so worried about that. What's important is that we get a nice clean cut on this upper edge here. So we're peeling this bark away. There we go. So there it is peeling away. 
All right, and we've made it almost all the way around the tree. One more piece there. All right, so now that we've gotten down to this layer, so this cambium tissue here, this is the stem cell layer, and it's just a few cells thick. I can tell is because this feels a little bit slimy. I can rub my finger on it and it's kind of wet. But that stem cell layer is what produces both the xylem on the interior of the wood of the tree, as well as it grows outwardly to form the phloem, and eventually that hardens into bark. If we allow this cambium to stay in place and protect it, it will actually heal. Being stem cells, it can reproduce new connective tissue and reform and heal this wound. So what we want to do is we actually want to scrape the cambium tissue away. And you can see this kind of white pithy material starting to scrape off. This is the cambium tissue that we're removing from the tree. So we want to make sure we get down through that all the way to the wood. And in this stage, it's important to do slightly overkill is better than not getting all the cambium off. So you can kind of see, one, I'm scraping all this off, kind of getting this sawdusty stuff off the cambium. And you can see a color change there. I'm going down to the next layer deep in the xylem here, and you can see that it's slightly darker yellow. And the layer above it has this kind of whitish color to it. So once you've gotten through all the whitish color, down to that next kind of layer of yellow, you know you've gone far enough. And so I need to do that all the way around the entire circumference of the tree, paying particular attention to this upper edge of the cut, because that is gonna be the place where we're healing, creating a callus and growing new roots. We wanna have that nice and even because this is going to be the plane where our new nabari is going to originate. There's a lot of videos out there that go into even more detail and have really nice diagrams explaining this air layering process. But I wanted to just show you a nice close-up view as well as discussing the design process. So I chose this area specifically so that we could create a nice girthy base to a new tree. Finding good material like this, even in you know, old landscape trees is a really valuable tool that you can use in your kit bag to be able to produce future bonsai in a much shorter time than growing something from a really small whip. And you can see here up at the top, I actually damaged the bark a little bit right there. Shoot for perfection. If we fall a little bit short, we'll still produce a nice air layer. So now that we've removed all of this cambium tissue, our goal is to heal this lower edge of the upper portion of the tree. The cambium tissue in this upper edge is gonna to start to callus, and that's gonna become this undifferentiated tissue, meaning it's gonna be tree material, tree cells of a tree, but it can turn into anything because it's still in that primordial stage. So once we've applied this air layer, what we've done is we've allowed a buildup of sugars and hormones to occur right here at this cut. That's gonna to start to callus, it's gonna to start to heal, and all of those hormones and that sugar are gonna send the tree a signal that it should grow new roots. And that is exactly what we are doing here. Sometimes people, when they're doing air layers, they get very concerned because they're like, oh, I can't let this sit here. But the reality is, if you have any doubt about whether or not you've removed all of the cambium tissue, you can actually let the tree just sit out open to the air for a few hours and the cambium tissue will dry out and die naturally. So some people prefer to just allow the cambium to air dry for a few hours rather than going through this entire scraping process. For me, I like to be more certain that I've removed all the tissue. I don't wanna to have to worry about any chance of it healing back. So I do like to give it the scrape. And then I generally allow it to sit open to the air while I'm preparing the enclosure for my root ball. And that gives it some additional time open to the air to make sure that we have 
fully killed off any stem cell tissue that remains here in this cut area. So you might be wondering, you know, since we did this air layer, we've only left two tiny little branches down below to fuel the tree. We also have maybe a little bit of energy supplied from the foliage on those root grafts, which is also nice. Uh, but this damage that we did to the tree here, this is going to really shock the tree. And it's gonna say, oh my goodness, I just lost the entire top of myself. That's gonna send a signal down to the bottom of the tree saying, I need to produce more branches. So either the two blood good shoots that we already saw earlier are gonna extend and grow extremely fast, or we may get some additional budding here at the lower edge of that cut site. All right, so here we are, and you can see we've got our cut here. We have skinned the bark all the way around the tree. Nice wide portion removed here. So the next stage is to prepare our container. And unfortunately, this little guy here is in the way, so we're gonna have to remove that. I'm just gonna slip that off and get it out of the way. I've got this large water container here, and it already has some wire holes here. I have to remove a couple of those. This is going to create a nice base for this air layer, but I need to cut it first. So we're gonna cut through this and we're gonna create an opening so that I can slip this around the tree. And then we'll end up having a nice pot right here where we can set this tree up uh, to grow new roots. So this is a pretty simple process. I'm just coming in here with the clippers and I'm trying to cut through this container. Got my favorite toenail clippers here. These really are a nice multi-use tool. I think I've been corrected. These are called cuticle trimmers. This may be a more proper name for these. See there, we made it into the first drainage hole there. All right, so we have made it through. The next thing we need to do is we need to increase the size of this hole so that it's the same size as this piece of the tree here. create this star shape in the center so that we can fold these flanges down. That will help us attach this pot to the tree. All right. So we're gonna bend these all down, trying to bend them without breaking them. Some of them will break off, but that's okay. All right, so we are going to see how easily we can slide this onto the tree here. There we go. Get above that screw. Slide this on. All right, just like that. You can see there I've got it wrapped around the tree. Just use the tip of my scissors here to puncture a few holes in the side of this container here. We need to be able to stitch this back together. There, all right, can we see that okay? Yep. All right, so I've got a little piece of aluminum wire that I'm gonna use to stitch this back together. Gotta do a shoelace job here if I can. So you guys remember we had this branch we were wiring. We're gonna also use this as an anchoring point for our container. Poke those up through. Twist those together. All right, it's looking nice and stable there. Some more of these small holes for tie points perimeter of this pot. One there, one here. And let's do one more over here. So through the hole. Give it a 
few twists. And then we will come up here and secure it to this dead stump right here. All right, now that alone has really secured this pot, but we're gonna make sure that this is rock solid. When we're doing an air layer, we wanna make sure we have as little movement as possible. We wanna make sure that the roots don't move at all while they are growing in that initial primordial stage because they're super fragile and they can easily break. All right, that's even better right there. So let's rotate around. And here we go. Same procedure here. We're gonna tie this conveniently. We've got that same dead stump there. And I'm looking at the orientation of this pot. Nice and level. All right, so we are looking really nice there. This one, I'd like it to be a little bit tighter. This edge of the pot is slightly dipping down. So let's pull that up, cinch it just a little bit more. There we go. Now is the time to make those final adjustments and make sure we have this absolutely perfect. We're about two thirds of the way up through that cut tissue, leaving only about a centimeter or half a centimeter below the cut in the pot. So there you can see that we have positioned our training pot just below that cut and that's going to be perfect to set up for a nice laterally spreading nabari on those new roots. All right now that we have our training pot set up the next step in the process is to add some rooting hormone. So you can use the powdered kind or you can use this stuff here which comes in this purple goo. So either one of them will work just fine and technically this process can work just fine without the rooting hormone because the tree will naturally produce its own. So I'm just using this chopstick here to dab the rooting hormone all around the lower edge. You wanna make sure that it gets in contact all the way around the perimeter. And this goo is nice because it's gonna drip down and it's gonna cover all of the exposed tissue. It's okay if you get a little too much on there. This is gonna get partially soaked up by the sphagnum moss that we're gonna apply next. So I've heard people talk about all the different types of media that you can use uh, for rooting cuttings or rooting air layers. With air layers, most people tend to recommend sphagnum moss. I have done a lot of different trials using sphagnum moss, using hairy moss that I've found locally, just on the ground. And it seems like everyone has a really good reason for why they recommend their specific variety of rooting media. The conclusion that I've come to is that sphagnum moss works the best because it really retains a lot of moisture, but it also has this really nice spongy texture to it and it pushes itself open, allowing air to get down in between the particles. Not only that, it's really long strands, which means it has a really nice wicking capacity so that if one area starts to dry out a little bit, it can pull moisture in from another area. So I tend to lean toward sphagnum moss as my rooting medium of choice. I am pushing this down in there to make sure that it's tucked up underneath that lower lip where we cut, because we want to have this in contact with the entire perimeter of that trunk line. And this is going to be our base layer. And so the job of the sphagnum moss is to maintain air and moisture at that cut site. That is really all that it does. A balance of water and oxygen. I'm sure you've heard Ryan Neal talk about it a hundred times. Balance of water and oxygen. Balance of water and oxygen. That is what every bonsai needs to be healthy. And that is what produces optimal growth in both the tree itself as well as a primordial root system. And now we're going to backfill that with some old bonsai soil. Some people are purists and say you have to use 100% akadama. Other people use no soil, only using their sphagnum moss until the tree has fully rooted. But for me, I like to, if possible, on these larger ones, if I can set up an entire training pot rather than putting it into a bundle, I can avoid that awkward intermediate phase of trying to transition from a plastic bag into a training container. And so what I've done is I've essentially set up the air layer and I've also set up the initial growing medium for those roots to grow out into. Now you can see that I'm putting this medium in dry. When the soil gets wet, it can be kind of clumpy and hard to deal with. So I'm just putting it in dry. I am going to wait a few minutes before I water this tree in. I wanna make sure that that rooting hormone has had plenty of time to soak in 
to the tissue of this tree. And I am hoping that by fall, we will see roots coming down through the drainage holes and probably down through the cracks in that area at the base of the tree. They'll naturally get air pruned off, so we don't have to worry about them taking over. And it looks like we got a, a blend of whatever random stuff I had laying around. I see some Akadama in there, a little bit of lava, a little bit of pumice, perlite, a couple little chunks of root. For some of these crazy aerial setups like this, perlite is really nice because it's fairly lightweight, so it's going to provide that medium. Good balance of water and oxygen, but it's not going to create an extremely top-heavy setup here. So the additional soil is also going to push down against that sphagnum moss and uh, prevent it from moving around. Again, creating that nice stable environment for those roots to develop. All right, folks, so we allowed about 20 minutes to pass, and we're going to come back in and give this a light watering. Not too much. We want to make sure we don't dislodge all that rooting hormone. All right, there always seems to be something special about moss. Both the sphagnum moss down below to encourage that new root growth, as well as this nice hairy moss here we're going to put on the surface. It's just going to really do a great job of having an antimicrobial effect and maintaining that really nice humid environment. A little bit of insulation while this tree recovers from this operation. Pack that in around the perimeter of the tree to ensure that we have that really nice environment those new roots. All right, folks, thanks for joining me on another episode of ACRP Bonsai, and we'll see you back here in a few weeks to recheck on these roots.